I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. The red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they can be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. Yeah, we're back. I I have sleeping problems, apparently. <laughs> this is not the first time. No, I sent you the, the text, and after a little while, I was like, you know what, I bet he's in, in human cat mode. Yeah, pretty much. That's basically my life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wake up, I do some work for something that I can't talk about on air, and then I do some work for my PhD, and then I fall asleep. Like, Rinse, oh, repeat. I also bike, I bike ride now, too. I've been doing oh, yeah? that. I've been keeping that up, yeah. The bike shop where we got our bikes, they're closed. They closed. It's so like, sad. Like, they closed permanently? Yeah, they shut their doors. Oh, shit. And they, they put up a sign like, thank you. You know, we had a great time being open for all these years. Yeah, I, I went to go grocery shopping and I was like, no. Well, that's weird because like that, that wasn't even their first location either. Oh, it wasn't? Oh, there's no, another I one out they, in like Rosendale, isn't there? Well, they used to be, they used to be in a different part on that road, like farther down, I thought, but maybe I'm wrong. Oh. Uh, yeah. Anywho, and speaking of bikes, I, uh, I nearly ate shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was making a turn uh, onto the like onto the walkway, yeah. and I caught the edge of the road, and I thought for a second my chain came off. <laughs> that it shouldn't. That hasn't been an issue for. I think they fixed that. Bikes got better. They fixed that. My my bike is my bike is new. I just don't have any. I don't have shocks because that's the type of bike. Oh, I have. you don't have shocks. Yeah. Oh. So so my entire my body absorbed the uh, impact of that. Yeah. Bike. I have sh- so you know get a bike with shocks, man. That that no. that's ever since I got I, shocks, I've never had a chain pop off or get stuck in between gears. But I like I like my bike. That they're do, fun. I can do cool shit with it. Do you have a little I thing mean, on I, the back so you can strap stuff to it? No, I don't want one of those. You can I just get a, one. I, I know. I, I have one of those like little. I have a little like pouch that has a uh, uh, a hand pump that barely works. Uh, a spare uh, tire that I'll probably never use, and uh, some batteries. So, yeah. No, <laughs> batteries. I, I, I still have a... Well, because, you know, in case I need to replace the batteries on my light. Oh, you have a light. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Well, because cause I, do, I do do some, like, light road driving. Yeah. Road riding, because I, I ride my bike to, uh, to the, the walkway, yeah. which is, like, a a biking path slash walking path on that topic um mm-hmm. you know we only have two more daylight savings left i didn't what? i didn't even know that i didn't know they, they i didn't know they're just stopping daylight savings they are okay i mean we, we I'm have fine we have the that. one in i'm fine with it too right yeah we've got this one in november coming up we have the one in march next year coming up and that's the last one Oh, they're gonna get us stuck. We're, they're gonna get us stuck. A uh, spring forward, not that, fall back. That was my. That was my first freaking comment. I was like, "Stop it! This Fuck. year, make quarter four of twenty twenty two the let. La- don't do. Don't take that hour from me. Let the rest of it, my keep, life have one more hour of sleep. Yeah, yeah. Let me have that like one hour for eternity. Yeah, exactly. Fucking no, they're taking the one hour from us, John. Hmm. Uh-huh. Wait, I'm trying to do math. They're taking the one hour from you because you <laughs> they're not taking an hour from me because this is my default state. So yeah. I'm I'm net zero in terms of lost hours. You you were born before uh, spring forward. So yeah. therefore, it's, you're the one who's losing an hour. I'm not looking forward Ha-ha! to it. It's going to be rough. It's going to be rough. <laughs> right. Because I, I usually go to bed by like 1130, but I wake up at 430. So that one, that's that one hour is a significant portion of my sleep. God damn it, Brandon. <laughs> I'm just a cat. Yeah. Most days. That's, that's my secret. Just be a cat. Cats are cool. 
which means I have to vomit everywhere and, you know, eat stuff that I shouldn't eat oh. and just lick myself until I have hairballs constantly. And you shit know, in my basement. Cat stuff. Gosh, I was cleaning my basement and I found my cat's secret shit pile. <laughs> what? Yeah, so I was Why? cleaning my basement and there's no pee, by the way, just poo poo in the all the way far back corner. It turns out, because, like, there's been a while where I'm like, man, they've been pooping less. And it turns out, no, they haven't been pooping less. They've been pooping in my basement. They just found the back corner. My basement, ugh. I had to get something, and it, it was it, 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 it was bad. Because I haven't, I've been redoing a lot of rooms, so I just moved everything to the basement, and it's been like that for a few months. Yeah. And um, it's spider times. So it was... These are facts. The, I, like, could, I, I would... It was so scary. Okay. So roughly half the length of my basement mm-hmm. was from waist height up to the ceiling, spider webs all the way back. Yeah. So I had to like, to get to the thing I had to get to, I got a broom and I got a, bo- a fill a spray bottle with peppermint oil. And I was just like clearing out and spraying peppermint, the whole house. I mean, it got, it got them out. The, 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 they're gone now. You know, peppermint oil does, did its job. But it's clearing out the spider webs, spraying peppermint oil. Look, and they're dropping from the ceiling at it, like dip, dip and dodge and duck. And I eventually got to the um the thing I was trying to get to to clean out, and I pulled the sheet away and found just piles of cat shit. <laughs> they were like, "We're trying to help with uh, we're trying to help with the uh, what you call it." No, um, they're not. It's it's. I think it's spiders. No, your cats are bad at their job. They're so no. They get crickets. Mulder gets crickets. She just waits by the door for a cricket to come in, and then she'll like leave a fucked up looking cricket like in the bedroom somewhere. Like three, like three a day. They'll, you'll just. This is just, for you. Yeah, she goes like, "Look, I made this for you," and I'm like, "Get it out of here! Don't do that because that's how you get worms." You shitty, shitty hunter! I made this for you. The one time I had a mouse, they wouldn't, like, they were just, I I felt bad for the mouse, because they, they wouldn't kill it. They were just slapping it and letting it have a panic attack. So it's like, <laughs> like, that's all they did. They wouldn't kill it, and they wouldn't get it at least. So I had to, like, get the cats away from the mouse, let the mouse have his little, panic attack in the corner so I could grab it and throw it outside. Little fucking psychopaths. They just suck at hunting. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. Apparently. Although, <sighs> uh, I say that and Dakota fucks up uh, spider hunting. But, so, there's there's a weird thing here. I'm fine with spiders most of the time, actually. Yeah. Um, Mainly because I think that they, they, they take care of worse things that do permanent damage. Yeah. Um, but Christine is not. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I've, like, reached a point where I've just accepted symbiosis with them, but I, I had to, uh, to recently, uh, leave that life behind effectively. Gosh. So. I, I'm not a fan of them, but I, I'm, like, if they're in the room, like, just keep your distance. Like, it don't come, I'll do something if you get too close, but, like, if you're on the corner, I mean, you, you have a blast in that corner, little man. Like, <laughs> that's, that's you where I'm little at. little dude. There's uh, um, there's one garden spider that I like. I named. He's by my side door. I love the garden. It's like a little house pet. So that that's the one spider that I'm cool with. I was I was um uh up moving some stuff in my shed, and I pulled my lawnmower back, and there was a spider. It was fast. It at first I thought it was a mouse. <laughs> like I was, <laughs> I noped so fucking fast out of that shed. It's like I guess I just don't need a shed anymore. That's that spider shed. Yeah, I like it. Ran from under the lawnmower to under the uh, my uh, little seed spreader or whatever. <laughs> I got the fuck out of that shed. I don't even have a seed spreader anymore. I I just use my hands. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I the, also the just I... Fer- fertilizer spreader. I, I I misspoke. Ah, uh, okay. I uh, I um. I actually uh, consciously have decided to let Clover take the bottom half of my yard because um, that's fine because I don't because actually it's one it's healthier <clears throat> for your yard and it's healthier yeah. for the environment because Clover uses less water mm-hmm. and two I don't need to fucking mow it as much 
Fair. Speaking of which, I was um I was clipping back the bushes at the back of my house, the ones yeah. that like overlook a cliff, which I can't get rid of because if I get rid of them, my backyard will literally fall into a cliff. Um, <laughs> but they're the shittiest bushes in existence. Um, so uh, I uh. I was trimming those, and I had a I have a uh, extension cord based. I have an electric trimmer. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, I was getting sweaty, and my eyes were covered. And as I was moving it, it was just like, and I'm like, <laughs> why did it stop? I have it held. I cut the <laughs> fucking electrical wire. I still need to get a new uh a new extension cable. I was like, I should I could probably fix that. And then I thought about it, and I'm like. I should probably not fix that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my mom does that all the time. Not cuts all the time, the twice. Yeah, it cuts the wire with the the, the trimmers. Yeah. It's easier than you'd think. It's so easy when you get it makes it makes it surprising when you get to a branch you can't cut through. Yeah. It's pretty it, much. Yeah. 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 Although I usually just fix mine. <laughs> There's, I'm just lazy. I'd rather not drive. Uh, I don't fix mine because I don't trust my ability to fix it in a way that won't kill me. Oh, uh, yeah, fair. If you're not confident in, enough to, uh, in working on the thing, don't work on the thing. Yeah, pretty much. That's that's my. I've I've already had enough experiences with uh, thinking I've been electrocuted to death by electricity. So like, I don't need to like choose to have those moments. Yeah. I told you that one time I grabbed an outlet with my bare hand. It right? bit you. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. And I, by fun, I mean, God damn it, that was terrifying. Um, I've gotten too comfortable with uh, electricity uh, to it. That's a that's extent. true. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that I used to, I used to work for a place, and I, it was faster for me to just like short a capacitor and see if it zapped me than it was for me to actually like. Go get the thing. <laughs> so there was there, there's there's a point in my life where I, I was just doing finger swipes, you know, just like do I get zap? Like, is it on? Yes or no? And if you if it feels like something bit you, it's still on. <laughs> That's way too com. As a disclaimer to everyone listening to the podcast, do not do that. <clears throat> do not do that. That is a very easy way to die. <laughs> there's what if you aren't? <laughs> yeah, don't do that to a thing that you don't know how it works. Yeah, no. It is an incredible. Be is an very well acquainted easy. with. Be very, very, very well acquainted with anything before you do that. Yes, that is a fact. <laughs> um. Anyway, Brandon. Oh, so also, um, P- uh, I know there's a person that works there that listens to this. You didn't hear that. I didn't do that. Shut up. <laughs> you heard nothing. <laughs> that never happened. <laughs> Also, nobody, nobody work working there trained me to do that. <laughs> oh, no. There was a guy that there's there, there's a lot of um, thermal transfer, uh, like dielectric, um, yeah, fluids there, and they all look kind of the same, and they all act very similar until you get do them. Do they taste different though? Jack used to taste them. <laughs> He retired, so I, I, I'm fine with that. But yeah, like... <laughs> he used to taste them. Propylene glycol is sweet, so if you've got, like, a bunch of baths that are unlabeled... <laughs> oh, God. And the viscosity is kind of similar between them, you taste them. It's not, it's not good for you. <laughs> I mean... It's not like, good. Propylene glycol, other than being a dielectric uh, fluid, is also what, um... Uh, the carrier for vape juice. So that one's fine to taste. The problem is what yeah, the problem is when you taste ones. it and it's not that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Um speaking of vape juice, this has nothing to do with vape juice. Actually, there's probably there's probably a vape that has the name of this week's cryptid on it. I almost guarantee it. I'm so excited um, for this one, by the way, because this cryptid was one of the cryptids in like the Scholastic Book Fair books that I used to like like yeah, getting gonna, so much. It's gonna be way worse than you think. Oh, is it is it a bad At what is whatever this... whatever Okay, so Brandon, this week's episode we're talking about Ogopogo. I literally 
uh, the the I want to tell you how I was inspired to do this. I was watching the Game Grumps yeah. play do like teenager quizzes, and one of them uh-huh. was like pick a cryptid, uh, like pick the sexiest cryptid or something like that. Yeah, yeah. and one of them was Ogo Pogo, and I looked over to Christina. I'm like, there's only one of those on that list that we haven't covered on the podcast. Oh, okay. And it's, it's Ogo Pogo, and then uh, she was like, well, there's your your next episode, and I was like, nah, that's not gonna be the next episode. Then I was like, I don't have any ideas. I guess Ogo Pogo is gonna be the one. <laughs> is 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 the meme you posted in our Discord directly related to a certain portion of this episode? The the metal bands one. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Hundred fucking percent. Of course. Hundred percent. Brandon, it's a Canadian cryptid. Oh, like, there you go. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, uh, the 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 meme was a video of a. a a comic of a dude finding a metal band and he was like wow i sure like this metal band i hope they don't have any ties to white supremacy (laughs) it's it's basically every canadian cryptid they're all Um, so bad they're they're all so so bad honestly uh barring wendigo ogopogo is up there in terms of the worst ones because not only not only is it offensive to first nations people it's offensive to people from the zulu nation Oh, they got they 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 got fancy with their bad. They they got a, they got like deep into the the bad stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, good. So I'm using two skeptical sources this week uh, as kind of like core framing devices: uh, Ogopogo the Chameleon and Ogopogo the Lake Okanagan Lake Mo- the Lake Okanagan Monster. Um, there's a snippet from Cryptozoology A to Z. Yeah. There's a snippet from Cryptozoology A to Z by Lauren Coleman um, and a section on lake monsters from uh, Hunting Monsters. Uh, but you see, the thing is, I wrote this this blurb before I started doing things. Uh-huh. Uh, those those second two are way less important to the story. There's um, there's a lot more sources on this week's episode. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, there's... <laughs> There's uh let me part the komodo. There's 26 sources for this episode. Let's let's not let's not use that term. That's not a great. That's not a great not a great term. Okay. Cuz it's related to like sex work and like enforced sex work and sex oh, trafficking and I stuff like that. Oh, I didn't those are dots yeah. I didn't connect. I heard that yeah. from the thing and just thought it was a silly gotcha. It, it, it was we 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 heard about it on Mabim Bam, but it does turn out that that's like not I great. thought they made that up. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, that I, has a history. That has a history. <laughs> I had me a learning experience. Yeah, yeah. Now we know. And what we do? What do we do when we learn? We try not to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So located in southern British Columbia, um, Lake Okanaga, Okanagan. I, I'm gonna butcher every name in this. I am sorry to anyone who's First Nations listening to this or is, like, close to anyone First Nations because, like, I'm not very good at the Silex language um, because it's it's super duper different and I have dumb tongue. I can barely speak Spanish, so, like, <laughs> there's that. I can um, barely speak English. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Let's be real. Uh, despite the, the, like, I think, I think like at last check, we have six days of content from this podcast. Do we have six days of content? Yeah. It's kind of wild. Um, That's like fun. continuous days. Uh, so Lake Okanagan, I should have probably written down a pronunciation guide for that, uh, is roughly 135 kil- kilometers long. It's a fjord yeah. with an average depth of 75 meters and a maximum depth of 232 meters. Um, so it's it's a pretty deep ass lake. It's a pretty long ass lake. Um, for reference, this is about a hundred kilometers longer than Loch Ness. Um, although its average depth is a little bit lesser, so probably it might be a little bit smaller by cubic volume. Not sure. Didn't do the math because I I, I didn't I didn't think that was po- like valuable. Um, yeah. And it has a greater maximum depth than Loch Ness, uh, which obviously I mentioned because you know Loch Ness monster, Ogopogo, all that good stuff. Um oh by the way Brandon can you just can you just drop what Ogopogo like is in your thoughts because I don't get into what 
Ogopogo's description is until like halfway through this episode. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So for so my my present thoughts on Ogopogo, it's another lake monster. It's a Nessie, but in a different mm-hmm. lake similarly described as, as Nessie. So it's Canada Nessie. It, it's a bit different. Um, it's a little more snake-like, a lot more snake-like, almost completely snake-like. Okay. Uh, but, but that's pretty much it. Yeah. Canada Nessie. Um, yeah. Yeah, basically. Uh, located in the uh, Okanagan Valley, the region sports a population of 362,000 people as of 2015. Um, despite a history of mining and whatnot, uh, its most prevalent industry today are real estate, tourism, and retirement real estate development. That's oh, correct. that's from the good. that's from the Wikipedia. Um, yeah, so like the other thing too is like first contact with settlers in the region was because they were like prospectors and miners um, and fur trade tradesmen, right? Yeah. Um, then the there was some gold found, which resulted in a a, tr- a boom, right? And then that's how the area got settled and, you know, colonized and all that good stuff. Yeah. You know, the good stuff. Uh, if you're white. Um, <laughs> naturally, there was a group of First Nations people who occupied the region long before any European settlers ever reached the region. Um, the Silex, commonly referred to as the Okanagan people, are an interior Celeste people who lived throughout the valley. So um, in... In northwestern, like the northwestern North America area, or actually southwestern, southwestern uh, Canada, northwestern United States, um, there's the group of the Celesh people who are like kind of like ubiquitous in the region. Um, interior Celesh means that they were not, uh, they were not on the like ocean, right? Oh, gotcha. Yeah, um, which there's. That's like the, the the defining line. Although they still they had set very similar. Like it, it's not like they were like completely dissimilar, right? Um, it was like, yeah. Um, so their lifestyle had them move throughout the year uh, in the region to hunt, fish, and collect food. Uh, in the winter months, the group lived in these sem- uh, semi permanent pit houses. Mm-hmm. Um, it, so it was basically just like you know a. Uh, uh, rotational living situation, right? Which is pretty common for yeah, it's uh, common. indigenous move, groups. Move throughout the year as the seasons yeah. change to to I mean, meet your needs. It, it also makes a lot of sense because then you don't put a huge strain on one local environment, <laughs> like one part of the local environment, and you can like kind of have a more sustainable living doing that. But you yeah, know. you're not vampire like sucking resources from the environment until it's gone yeah. forever. You're kind yeah, of pretty much. Taking, you know, what you need and then, you know, Moving letting it along. do its own thing. Move on. It it regenerates and look at that. You, come, you back, come back. All your stuff's back. It's crazy. Which is pretty pretty much what animals do, too, for that matter. It's, it's yeah. weird. I it's think, weird. Like, we're the, it's weird how we're, the, like, the only people who do, only, like, creatures on Earth who do that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, first contact with the European settlers came in 1811 in the form of fur trading, as I noted before, um, with the first settlement coming in 1859. So actually a little bit late for the Western gold rush in the, in like the, in North American continent. Um, cause it's okay. the 49, 49 was when, um, cause like the, the 49ers, right? The, the minor 49er from Scooby-Doo. Yeah. yeah well then the, the like 49ers, the football team. That's sport. It's true. That's true. I don't sports God, much. The first season of Scooby Doo has some some real, real hot takes. Some real real choices that they made. <laughs> um, over time, Canada did what Canada does best, and they colonized the shit out of the region. Right? Yeah. Uh, they displaced the First Nations people and disrupted their way of life. Uh, this, of course, included residence schools and the attempted eradication of their culture. Uh, for reference, I talk about this shitty set of circumstances in episode 100 about the Bigfoot. Um, because, of course, the Bigfoot has a relation to all those things, too. Um, <laughs> it's not great. It's really no. bad. It's 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 super not good. It's, um, well, to, to, to give people a, a rough idea of the scope of the not coolness... Um, I think there was there were nearly like 600 different um, tribes that had 
uh, independent languages, but also more or less one common sign language that they could all yeah. communicate with if they didn't have this sh- shared verbal language and a trade and in, in, in commerce and uh, network through all of them. And uh, yeah. now to name more than five. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not it's not fun. It's no. not good. It's very bad. I think there's only like 40 native speakers, like people who are, are fluently speaking like the Silex language, which yeah. is like very like that's a that's a critically endangered language. Uh, it's not the most, but it is absolutely endangered. Yeah. Um, oh, and also like the protections given to them are also weirdly is like blood purity is like the, like yeah yeah. So like if you have two grandparents that were both Native Americans, but they were from two different tribes, then your blood isn't pure enough to gain to to have whatever um, the government would would help you with because your blood isn't pure enough one tribe. So like what? yeah, so like th- that's at least that's for the U.S. I don't know. I can't speak for like oh, okay. other regions, but in the U.S., like Jesus like, fucking Christ, they're still doing like blood purity to prove your race for that's Native some fucking Americans. Eugenic shit. <laughs> yeah, it's still cool. super not cool. Good and cool. Good yeah. and cool. I am super happy to hear that. Um, God damn it. So we begin, begin our Ogopogo-based journey with a bit of Silex legend, um, alleged by many modern believers uh, in the lake monster to either be the origin point or proof of the key creature's com- provenance, right? So this is kind of like the standard, you know, oh, well, the natives said something about it, so that means it's true, right? Yeah. Um, it's not It's it's not that straightforward, in my opinion, but we'll, we'll get into that. So... um. In my exploration of the subject matter, I found a prevailing narrative in the history of the Ogopogo. Most histories link Ogopogo to the Silex legend of Nahaotic. I think that's how you pronounce it. Nahaotic. Um, I could be completely wrong in that. It's Silex, so my um, you're trying. My pronunciation might be off. Yeah. Um, which is a uh, uh, contentious. At least a little bit. Uh, at least for people who who are not um, from the cultural tradition that spawned it. So, um, ostensibly, uh, Naha Atik translates to water demon. Um, however, this is like a fully lurid uh, iteration of the translation and completely bullshit. Like, when I say bullshit, I mean 150% bullshit. Uh, That's a lot this of bullshit. Particular yeah, this this particular translation appears to have taken a particular virulent hold with even the Skeptical Inquirer uh, article by Benjamin Radford propagating that translation. Um, and it seems that it was popularized by Mary Moon in her book Ogopogo, although I can't um, I can't be sure because I didn't have access to the book Ogopogo because it's one of those books that just exists in British Columbia, kind of, because it was like... Yeah. It was one of those like like limited print like it was one of those like like we 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 are here for tourism not so much for everything else. Yeah. Um now, in contrast, almost well actually every Silex source I can find refers to Nahaatik as meaning something closer to spirit of the lake or there is a sacred being in the water. Um okay. interestingly, an article by Indigenews, which is an amazing site name, I want to point out. Indigenews, that's great. That's yeah. a fucking that's a fucking wonderful thing. Um, points to three sources that use the water demon translation, all of which conspicuously have removed the translation or the page altogether. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, this article came out, I think, in 2021. Yeah. But like there's now like the those like some of those links are now dead. Because they used to have information about the Ogopogo. And I looked up to see if they did still have it. Yeah. And th- there was a version of it that had it. One of them never mentioned it. But there was a version that called Ogopogo the Water Demon. And it was like an official like Kelowna or like local um, local towns yeah. like website. So yeah, it's, it's good. <laughs> it's super good and super pervasive. But you know, whatever. Um, it's it's not like it's a completely different interpretation of the word or yeah. what like the intent of the of the of the entity is. You know, nothing nothing like that. It's not completely different at all. It's not completely different, and it's not like you know, 
uh, a little bit, a little bit of a noble savage type thing where they're kind of, you know, demonizing uh, uh, religious beliefs. But you know, whatever. Everything's good. <laughs> yeah. For reference, uh, before we get any comments, uh, that was that was sarcasm. It's not good. Oh, yeah, not good. Yeah. I just I just wanna I wanna point that out. That was sarcasm. That Very was much like so. dripping sarcasm. Um so in this villainous interpretation of the creature It was moist with sarcasm. It was moist. <laughs> it was so moist. Very moist. Oh god. If you like if you like just lightly squeeze that that sentence, it would just like ooze. Um I have an ooze. Anywho. <laughs> so the villainous interpretation of Ogopogo slash Nahotic um, appears to largely be an instance of sell- settler lore erasing indigenous stories, which, you know, name a name a more iconic thing. I'll wait. Um, and supplanting them in the uh, broader cultural context. This also happens with... So even though I, I, ref- I haven't done it, I'm not probably going to ever do a Wendigo episode, this explicitly happens in uh wendigo lore like the whole notion of wendigo psychosis that's that's some like white people shit that they came up with to like add on top of the story um it, it there's it's not great it's it's very not good um so for the sake of completeness of the episode however i will recount the oft reported legends that have been told uh supposedly from the context of indigenous people uh depicting nahotic as a demon um, however, please note uh, that the following stories come from white storytellers, and not only that, um, a bigger deal in this is uh, like we don't know. We don't know if these people actually talk to any indigenous people. <laughs> oh yeah, to, to say this, that's a thing like, that happens. I forgot that's a that's, thing. That's like super thing, right? Um, yeah. And the the person who I have this first story from was. Uh, he was a member of the Okanagan uh, Historical Society. He was one of the founding members. Um, and he he says some things that uh, make me question his authenticity as a human being. Oh. Well, no. No. Uh, he, he, I'm completely 100% confident that this person is a human being. He makes me question his authenticity as, like, not a complete, like, monster. And I don't think he's not a complete monster. I think he's a complete monster. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I hate this dude. There we go. <laughs> That's it. Um, so to begin the story, uh, Buckland uh, said that he... Uh, uh, oh, wait, wait. Mm, I skipped a whole fucking paragraph here. So uh, the story details the history of, ma- of a man named Tim Basket who had a fatal run-in with Nahotic. Uh, based on my research, this particular story originates from historian... Uh, Frank Buckland in his 1927 Story of Ogopogo article featured by the Okanagan Historical Society, uh, which he was a founding member of. Um, Conspicuously, uh, the reproduction of the article I found highlights that the story was written uh, for the entertainment of his brothers and sisters. So, um, I don't know what they mean by that. Yeah, I don't know if they mean like it was... uh, I don't know if they mean it was like, like how much of this is crafted and how much of this is like actually researched. I don't, yeah. I don't have like a good, I don't have a good example of this dude's bona fides because like, he's a local historical society member, so he might be a historian, but he's also a local historical society member in 1927. So like, uh, take everything that you're about yeah. to hear with a grain of salt, um, because this is this this dude's like the origin point for this particular story. Um, to begin the story, Buckland says that he heard this story on, and this is a direct quote, on good Indian authority. Huh. Yeah, that a local tribe had been planning to attend a large gather- gathering in the southern end of the lake. Allegedly, a live dog would be sacrificed near Squally Point. Um, sometimes this is like, so So there's two islands on in Lake Okanaga, there's Squally yeah. Point in Rattlesnake Island. Um, Squally Point is one of the places that, that this creature is said to appear. Rattlesnake Island is typically the place that they say that it, it comes from. Like, that's where it lives. Like, yeah. in, a ca- in a cave underneath it or something along those lines. Just to kind of give you some, like, geographic context to this story. Yeah. Um, so, 
it was sacrificed in Squally, near Squally Point because that's somewhat close to where uh, Nahutic lives um, as an offering to ensure safe passage, right? Um, so in this particular story, the notion of like, like Nahutic is like a being to be appeased, right? Yeah. And like, it's like a troll bridge. kind. Of, it's like a bridge troll a little bit in this story, right? Yeah. Um, if we're gonna con- if we're gonna compare it to uh like tropes of of like storytelling, it's a bridge troll effectively. Yeah, I'm Just gonna I'm gonna wanted. withhold all my Danny DeVito references. I really wanna make one That's fair. Right. It it's the, the, that's fair. The wheel's turning, but the hamster's dead. <laughs> yeah, that's probably that's probably for the better, Brandon. It's it's actually definitely for the better. We'll we'll just leave we'll leave that one dead. Um So the canoes were also uh, adorned with symbols to ward off the entity. Now, one individual, this the tin basket dude, uh, was unconvinced about the necessity of the ritual and refused to follow the instruction of the shaman leading it. Uh, in his bravado, tin basket traveled too close to the home of Nahatik and was summarily attacked by the creature in the lake. The canoe carrying Tim Basket and his family was dashed across the rocks by the creature, and they were pulled under in raging waters. Later on, the canoe was said to have been found and just, like, completely shredded, right? Um, so this is, this this also kind of has, like, this also is, like, stinks of, um, Icarus a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, to a degree, it's like a combination of Icarus and, the, and a bridge troll, um, which places this into the category of something that could very easily have been bullshitted by a white writer. Um, I don't know. I don't know if this is an authentic story from their, from like, cause I didn't find this being quoted by any like authentic Silex sources just yeah. from this one dude who wrote a thing for a local historical society. Um, so that's like, that's like one of the stories that people always tell in relation to Nahotic in Ogopogo. Um, so Arlene Gall, um, who's a person who took a bunch of like, uh, who took a bunch of Ogopogo photos that I literally couldn't find on the internet, which was weird, um, because they're like one of the most prolific writers about Ogopogo, but yeah. like, all their stuff, none of their stuff is like digitized, it seems like, which is like baffling. It's they're weird dead and now. annoying in that, by the way, is why I got this sh- shitty old book from the 70s is because the photo people kept citing photos and I couldn't find them anywhere online so I had to buy a book from some guy from the 70s that had the photos you should should scan those photos and upload them for the good of of mankind I'll I'll definitely do that at least for our uh, our discord server alright Let's do yep, that. Because they're this is like um, the place where they live is in this book. You can find two two of them, but there's like a whole like twenty pages of them. Jeez. Um, so Arlene Gall claims that this this the following has come from a First Nation storyteller by the name of uh, Dave Parker. Okay. Uh, which which is possible, but uh, whatever. Um, on the origin of Nahotik, apparently. At some point in history, a murderer named Kel Oniwan, which I say with with a bit of mirth because it sounds so close to Obi Wan Kenobi. It sounds close. Have you watched Andor? Not yet. I have to watch it's... Andor. I have to watch Kenobi. I have to watch the second season of Mandalorian. I have to watch. You haven't seen the second the season of, of Mandalorian. Fett. You haven't I watched have Book watch... of Boba Fett. I have to watch so much of it, Brandon. I've been slowly collecting the Mandalorians that they release for the vintage collection because I love Mandalorians, but that's a whole nother thing. Yeah, I couldn't. I kept falling asleep through Alderaan. I don't know. I can't tell you what episode one's even about. Of what Andor or? Oh, sorry, Andor. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. It's it's. Well, it's it's based off of the guy from Rogue, Rogue One, right? I I gotta watch episode two. It's so it's so. It's such a hard start. I'm going to give it a chance because there's a lot of shows that are really good where you need to give them a couple episodes. But, oh boy, Andor's, uh, at least episode one's Spe- a snoozer. Speaking of Disney+, Plus, She-Hulk is actually really good. Erica, I haven't seen it yet. I'm, it, it's on my uh, get around to watching list. Erica loves it. I'll be watching the baby it's, and hear Erica just laughing from the other room. It's, it's She really it's likes it. It's pretty funny. 
Yeah. It's it's pretty funny. There's a there's a cameo appearance by Mag- Megan the Stallion and it's fucking hilarious. That sounds amazing. Um anywho. So Kel Oniwan apparently had killed an old man with a club, right? Yeah. Uh, which resulted in d- divine retribution, of course. Um, and this is a quote from the Arlene Gal write-up. Uh, Changed Kel Oniwan into a lake serpent, a restless creature who would forever be at the scene of the crime where he would suffer continued remorse. He was left in the custody of the beautiful lake goddess and was known to the tribemen as Nahotik, the remorseful one who must live in the lake with the company of other animals. It is said that the only animal who would tolerate him, tolerate his company, was the rattlesnake. Um, so, in this particular iteration of the story, uh, Nahotik is a separate entity uh, with proximal relation to the monster, which is a supposed, supposed demon. Uh, so, like, in this case, Nahotik is, like, divinity, and um, the the monster is a thing that they're containing, effectively, right? Gotcha. Um, it's a bit different, uh, and it also kind of, like, it also kind of, like, if anything, this is probably a more likely story than the, the Tim Basket, but yeah. I think that this is still not completely authentic. I'm not sure. I'm not. I obviously haven't talked to any Silic sources to confirm or deny this, um, and I don't have access to any sources that confirm or d- deny this outright. Um, so, I, I think I think it's on the 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 better thing we can do is assume that this is a story, and uh, unless someone from the Silex like uh, unless a Silex person who's like a like you know, keeper of history or something along those lines comes along and says that it, it didn't happen or did happen. Uh, just assume that it's a story that's tied to Ogopogo. That would be my. I think that's probably the safest way of of going about this. Um. However, uh, as I noted before, this does not support the usage in the to uh, describe the lake monster. Kel Oniwan was provided with an eternal tone, uh, torment to atone for their misdeeds, locked into a horrifying shape. In many ways, this in the previous iteration, wow, uh, of the creature, a sort of boogeyman um, to warn of dangers inherent to the lake, right? So it's uh-huh. it's kind of like a thing to say, oh, watch out, or Nahotik's going to get you, right? But once again, I don't think that that's, that doesn't seem to match up with the iteration of the story that we've heard. Yeah. Um, so, unsurprisingly... Uh, the oft-repeated lore that supposedly comes from First Nations lore uh, runs dry around here, right? Uh, yeah. There's allegations of images depicting the appearance of Nahotik, uh matching the modern depictions of Ogopogo. Supposedly there's like three glyphs in the area that kind of look like Ogopogo. Um, I've seen them. One of them is literally just a ha- an arc. like like It's like a half circle. Yeah. Um, people are like, that looks like Ogopogo coming out of the water, which is like dumb first of all uh and then <laughs> the most frequently cited one uh was on vancouver island which is like a ways away from uh yeah from lake okanagan um very and far then, away also i think vancouver island has the highest cougar population in the world it might and not that's not a cougar island we, joke that's Brandon, a that's an animal fact Brandon, this was this was this was literally what what resulted in us talking about pitching the idea for Cougar Island. Yeah, because it's a good idea. God damn it! God damn it! It's been like a year or two since we talked about that, and you're you're you still think it's a good idea. It's it's almost the the, the hard thing is the consent Honestly. portion. So we have to make sure that everything like. All the different like variables and possibilities that could play out get consented to prior to them actually happening, because blow darts. So, so now that I think about it, I've been watching a lot of reality dating shows, and like, I guess it's not that much worse than Married at First Sight. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty the same. Pretty much the same level of like questionability. Now that I think about it, it's. So, honestly, we probably could sell it to a network. Yeah, but th- this one, it, 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 it kind of, it, it, it's, it gives the women the power, right? Because they're the ones with the blow darts. Awful. Because it's it's their cougars with 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 blow darts, 
and a bunch of like college, you know, guys that own a lot of polo shirts. And it's, you know, like they are the ones that, yeah. It's a really good idea. You just need to make sure they're uh, trained on like how to use a blow dart. Don't over, like, don't shoot someone too many times so they overdose. Make sure they're not going to fall and hit their head on a rock when you tranquilize them. Um, the, uh, do, do like, do like, uh, frat bros still pop their collars? I don't know. I, I'm not I up to date on their. I don't know. On the know. current, like, bullshit stuff that they do. I don't... What? What? <laughs> to be fair, though, to be fair, though, I think a lot of that just was, like, intended to minimize the actually terrible stuff that they did. Right? And distract from the fact that they did, like, How can it be a monster, but also have a collared shirt? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, did I ever tell granted, you about the one time Nate got roofied? Nate. Oh, there's a guy that used to work. He was a someone roofied their bartender, but it was Nate. Oh, okay. But like, but he, but he, like, he was very angry about it because he didn't know why. He was like, "I'm working." <laughs> like some so roofie. Weird. Yeah, it's. Yeah. Uh, God damn it, people! Pe- people just be bad. People just be doing I the hate- bads. I just hate people. That's just all there is to it. If there's anything you need to learn from this podcast, fuck people. Also, it, it apparently takes a long time to recover from a roofie. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, it's not good for you. No. It's not good for people. It's bad. No, well, some people do it to themselves for fun. Well. That's the only responsible way to. <laughs> that is literally the only way to use it in which it's not morally abhorrent still not recommended i'll say that yeah there's other there's i don't other ways. recommend that there's other things you can do yeah um anywho in terms of like these depictions of ogopogo brandon there's one that's even worse yeah. in that uh one of the cited images of nahotic come is two thousand miles away in toronto oh good definitely the <laughs> same thing yeah the funny thing is, it might be, like, it, it could potentially be, like, a depiction of a sea monster, right? It could but be. But, like, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a depiction of Nahotic. It would be a de- depiction of something totally different. The, it, it, like, I'm not saying people don't travel. I'm just saying that it's far less likely to be something not local to that area. Yeah, a little bit. A yeah. Little bit. Um, so, now that we've covered the stories of questionable provenance about the nature and history of Nahotic... Um, let's turn to confirmed Silex knowledge. Things that I know came from a Good. Silex knowledge owner. All right, we're uh, in a safe holder. place now. Yeah, so these these definitely are factual and related to like actual like Silex beliefs and things along those lines. Um, the the knowledge holder's name, like their English name, is uh, Trisha Manuel. Um, I really can't pronounce her Okanagan name. I can't even, like, actually read it um, because of the, like, it's it's a different, like, character set. Um, so, like, I really want to be able to pronounce it, but, like, I don't even know where to begin on the pronunciation. Yeah, di- um, different language, different writing. Thi- yeah. Thi- thi- things be difficult. It would it would be like me looking at kanji and being like, I, I, I literally don't know where to begin. Yeah. Yeah, or, or Cyrillic, actually, for that matter. Cause, cause I know it's not Borkbon. I know it's not, but that's what it looks like. <laughs> what? Hey, Bork. Bon. That's it's from. Uh, it's from. Do I mean Pork uh, Ban? No, it was from. It was from Daisy. Remember, there was like a. Oh. Like, like it was oh, like it had like a, yeah, a I, bee looking thing. We we're like yeah. it's Borkbon or something it, along those lines. I forgot about Daisy. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah, Bork a lot bon. of that shit. Is anyone in Cherno? Yes. <laughs> yes there the answer is always yes, and they have a sniper. The is S. It's a sniper. Yeah. There's a sniper in Cherno. That's who's in Cherno. Remember, remember, Ducky? remember when we got? Well, yeah, I remember. That was that was that was funny. Um, but remember when we got like really badass snipers, and then we just went outside of Cherno and just became the Cherno snipers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I learned, Brandon. I learned how the fucking dot scope works. 
on that sniper rifle so I could shoot people more effectively and ruin people's days. We, 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 we put in the time, we grinded really hard, got the come up, and then just turned into the people that we hated the most. Well, that's, that's the, I mean, that's the, like, American dream, effectively. Yes. That is literally the American dream. Like, yeah. there's, there's no difference whatsoever. <laughs> you just become the people you hate. Yeah. Um, and continue the cycle of violence. Yeah. Uh, so, anywho, um, uh, Trisha, Trisha Manuel literally says, like, don't fucking listen to the Western interpretation of Nahotic because it's not, like, what it is at all. Um, once again, she she notes that the name is there is a sacred being in the water um, and outlines the duty of that being. So um, this is a direct quote from the article uh, for reference uh, that I found this in. It was from Indigenous talking about uh, her belief system. Um that sacred being takes care of the water, and that's just not Okanagan, but all the waters in the system through the Okanagan nation. That that part of who Nahotik is, is important to our people. He reminds us of the sacredness of the water, and a part of what I do all the time is to remind the ones that I work with that we are all made of water. So it's it's a metaphysical being, right? Yeah. Like, it's, it's not... This is this is one of those things where uh, white people like to make things seem like they're like nuts and bolts and like physically extant, where it's not necessarily what it is, right? There's there's it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be it, like a physically yeah, it extant doesn't have thing. to be a tangible, it doesn't yeah. it a thing doesn't have to be able to ha be caught in a cage. Yes, that's that's the thing, and like it, it's a completely valid like belief system to have. So like, uh, we're just bad at it. We're bad at interpreting things. Like, it, yeah, we're, we're just bad at it. Like, there's you, you 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 a lot of the issues that <laughs> there are many issues that that uh, settler colonizers had with taking things literally. Yeah. To like Well, that's that's the whole thing with the fucking you know how people talk about like the Manhattan beads? Right? Yeah. Like that's that's not what that's not like the understanding that was there when they gave up when they like it's, accepted those trades. A lot of our history is almost like if if you just made a, a horde of Charlie Days colonize an area. Pretty much, pretty much, and and then that's just that's just where and that's how we got to where we are today. I mean, I pretty much there's not a colonizer that I wouldn't compare to Charlie Day, except Charlie. But worse, Charlie Charlie Day has a childish is innocence. Innoc he's an innocent, like he's got this degree of innocence. Colonizers don't. No, <laughs> not, not at all. Not, like, like the only reason I caution against using Gar Charlie Day as like a comparison is because like Charlie could be an asshole, but like it's not, it's not always willful, right? Yeah, he is. Do, you know what? Let's stop. Let's let's stop this. this let's train of, let's, this train let's, of let's, thought. let's 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 work on let's separating. Just that it's always sunny suck. from yeah. <laughs> colonizers suck. That's the end. Yeah. Um so, uh, to the Silex by way of Trisha, uh, the Nahatek is a sacred being, not one to even be remotely feared uh, by my read of her telling. So, like, you know how there's that, like, notion of awesome, right? Where it's something that's powerful and you fear it, but it's, like, a good entity. I yeah. don't even think it would fall under the awesome categorization. I think it would just literally be a good being based on this. Right? Yeah. Um, instead, it is a positive entity that protects rather than destroys. An offering ceremony to Nahatek does exist... Uh -huh. However, uh, as it as it turns out, it doesn't involve the sacrificing of a live dog. Uh, that's huh. pretty much a guaranteed settler myth. You're that telling they came me that guy to took some them. liberties? Yeah. <laughs> um, instead, there's an offering of meat that's provided in the ceremony. Uh, Trisha mentions deer, right? So, um, and while those are on, while that meat is being taken out in a canoe, 
Uh, there's those on shore who sing a prayer to keep the water clean, clear, and protect the people. Right? It's uh, yeah. it, it's 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 you know a, it's a reason it's it's a reasonable it's a ceremony. ceremony. Yeah, it's a reasonable ceremony. Right? It's 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 like a mindfulness thing more than anything else. Right? Yeah. And like like it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. There there's no like sinister, demonic, whatever, or like negative connotations that should be associated with this. Right, like, whatever. Yeah, it's what um, it's cool and good. <laughs> yeah, it's cool and good. <laughs> yeah, like, cause, cause this, this is literally what the prayer is about. Uh, praise that no one drowns or dies, whether they are on a boat driving along the lake. That is our prayer. That people are safe around this water for the birds, the four-legged, the crawlers, and the swimmers. All life needs the water to be clean. So that is our prayer. Which yeah. honestly, way better than the way that we usually handle water in general. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Ours it's has a far polio. Cry. Yeah. Oh, does it? <laughs> yeah. <sighs> God damn it! Right. Let that. That's that, yeah, their their water thing is cool and good. Our water's gonna bring back polio. 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 Cool. <laughs> is that in the? Is that like in the Hudson Valley? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. That's 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 particularly. Um, Ironic when you consider the fact that FDR is from the Hudson Valley. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's okay to make fun of him because he was a president. Yeah, oh, no. <laughs> FDR is perfectly fine to be made fun of because he was a fucking asshole. <laughs> every, literally every president ever has been a shit heel. So, like, yeah. don't worry. Like, you can make fun of any president ever. They're all fair they're game. <laughs> yeah. They're all fair game. I, I think the act of becoming president just like pretty much solidifies the fact that you're a big enough asshole that you spent all your time to become president that it's like, nah, fuck you. Yeah. Um so regardless, the the tales of Nahotic that are told by Trisha are far cry from the uh, lurid tales that permeate the stories recounted by white settlers and their descendants. Um this results in the story smelling of the demonization of indigenous people by white folk, which, you know. It kind of is, right? Yeah. Um, Long history of that going on, too. Yeah. So, with that out of the way, uh, we can now p pivot towards the entity known as Ogopogo. Uh, personally, I don't think that there's a solid link between Nahotic and Ogopogo. I think Nahotic existed, right? It was in the region. People are aware of this thing, right? And it's, like, you know, the red tellings of it. And as a result, people like had this inkling that there was a lake monster or something along those lines, which then resulted in people seeing a lake monster, right? I think I think that Ogopogo is not a modern version of Nahotic because conspicuously Nahotic doesn't have like a set in stone description. Yeah. Right? That I saw. Um I think I read somewhere that there's depictions of that have it having an antlers and things along those lines and like being snake like, but I think it's such a tenuous, tenuous gra like link, right? That I think that Ogopogo is like the the white settler imagination imposed upon. Uh, yeah, it, it's the, the the white settler being incapable it, of not taking things as literal things. Like, yeah, it 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 kind of feels like they molded they molded like indigenous traditions to fit their needs yeah like they're, they're connecting um, wrong dots and like yeah not being incapable of believing that spirits are real just made a thing like an ogopogo <laughs> yeah so yeah. i want to i want to point out that like when i'm talking for the rest of the episode um nahotic is the is the the like entity that is still to this day like is the real spirit in entity Silex role? Like yeah. it's still it's still in like like Silex ritual, still in uh, Silex cosmology, all that good stuff. Um, Ogopogo is the bastardization of that, right? So when yeah. I say Ogopogo, that's what I mean. I don't mean that this is a continuous trend. I mean that Ogopogo is this shit like shitty version of the thing, right? Um, so I just want to get that out of the way because. The rest of the episode, I'm just going to be using the term. What's that? What's that SpongeBob called that was like a sketch that came alive? Doodle Bob. Doodle Bob. Ogopogo's Doodle Bob. Okay, fair enough. So, 
I can't really find a good consensus on the official origin point of modern Ovapogo. Um, however, there is a common story that seems to be taking place around 1954. Um, it is likely, however, I would misinterpret this as a willful misinterpretation of uh, First Nations lore because, you know, uh, there's first contact in 1811, right? So 19, 1854, they have access to these myths um, and legends. Uh, but, like, it's it's messy. It's messy. It's hairy, and nobody's like done the actual work to untangle these stories, in my opinion. Yeah. Um Even the even the 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 uh, uh, the skeptical inquirer article doesn't really do a great job of untangling these, in my opinion. But you know, whatever. Uh. So, <clears throat> and I don't have like original sources for these particular stories. So it's this is like, you know, secondhand storytelling. Um. So, in the 1854 story, a settler na- by the name of John McDougall is said to have been swimming with a t- swimming a team of horses across the lake when the creature of the lake, still referred to in this story as Nahotic, in the tell uh, in all the tellings that I could find, um, pulled the team of horses beneath the water of the lake, fearing the fast disappearing forces would pull him under as well. The man quickly cut the line to save his life. Right, a fate deserved by anyone by all McDougals. That's if right. you're a McDougal. Go to a lake. You know. You know. You know. You know. <laughs> um, despite McDougal's story uh, ostensibly predating it, Miss Susan Allison has also been identified as the first white person to have recorded seeing Ogopogo. Now, this might be that she like actually wrote an account of it or something along those lines. Um, I don't know. This this is see, this is where the Ogopogo storytelling gets a little bit like muddy because I'm not really sure what people mean when they say the words that they say. <laughs> if that makes sense uh, just like, don't trust I feel her like... she has two first names that's true that's true um i can't find her initial sighting account um however it's said that she saw a snake like creature um hilarious however ogopogo quest which is a website that tracks like ogopogo sightings yeah uh notes that her description was very specific but doesn't repeat what? any part of it on the sightings page. Oh, cool! Very so, like, funny. It, it Very rates funny. like the, the the quality of sightings. No, no, it doesn't. It just in this particular one, it used the words "very oh, specific." Gotcha. Yeah, um, and I think I don't remember when exactly this was. This is sometime between eighteen. I think it was like in the eighteen seventies. I didn't write down the date. Um, so, speaking of descriptions, and this is where I finally describe Ogopogo. Uh, the modern Ogopogo, because I got to this point in my write-up, and I was like, oh, shit, I haven't talked about what Ogopogo looks like. <laughs> um, so the modern Ogopogo is far from homogeneously defined. In terms of shape, Ogopogo resembles the typical sea serpent with an undulating body ranging from 8 to 70 feet in length. That's a bit of a range, folks. That's a range. Um, the skin of the Ogopogo is similarly variable. The color is ranging from light green to jet black. With textures that can be smooth, snake-like, or even slimy. So, you know, cool. At this point, uh, I would start suspecting there's multiple lake monsters. There's 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 questionable stuff. Uh, when it comes to height, uh, Ogopogo is said to um, match Lake Cham- its Lake Champlain cousin, uh, towering at a 15 feet out of the water, which is fucking insane. That's huge. That's huge. Right? Like... Like, I can't articulate how big that is to be able to stick that much of your body out of the water. Like, <laughs> I mean, so I just like, have to lay on my back, but okay. <laughs> oh, that would be awful. <laughs> that would be you would you would die if you saw if you saw something that caught your interest. You would just die. Oh yeah, you, you're dead. You're a dead man walking. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's so weird. Every time. <laughs> Every time Brandon looks in that particular direction, he, he like just turns dies for a bit. pale and passes out. <laughs> yeah, he he kind of dies. It's like <laughs> it's like the little death, except more permanent. Yeah. Um. So uh, Ogopogo has been said to have the head matching either a snake, sheep, cow, deer, or horse, complete with beady eyes and whiskers. Right. Um, yeah. So. Pretty much, uh, based on that description, it's either a snake or something with like a, a more like equine or bovine head, 
right? Um, just a general like beast of burden head, yeah. so to speak. Um, things with hooves. Sometimes, yeah. It's sometimes a, it has a horns. Head. Horns a are always head? cool. Hoven head. What if thing? If a thing? Had, oh, never mind. I, they, I was going to ask a question, but the answer wasn't a question. <laughs> I was going to say, um, if something has hooves, what do you call it? Because in my head, I thought the word hoven, but I was like, no, it's hooves. There's there's a there's a thing for there is actually a name for things with cloven hooves. I can't remember it off the top of my head though. Um. So sometimes Ogopogo has horns. Other times ears. Regardless, they protrude from the top of his head. Or its head, rather. Um, its tail can be forked and has appendages of all configurations. That is to say, Ogopogo is basically whatever someone wants it to be. Yeah, it's an anything. Which, which is how you know that it's real. Yes. Um, yeah. So I have um I have a composite sketch here that was made by Joe Nickel, um to depict what Ogopogo like looks like. Yeah. Uh, in his, it has a pretty high speed, undulating motion, up to 70 feet long, typically has webbed feet or flippers, long neck, whiskers, small or no ears, <clears throat> and you can generally see some humps coming out of the lake, right? Yeah, it looks uh, it's like a, little, it's, a long otter, and I, I like, he put notes in there, it, it, unbelievable speed, undulating movement. So we'll get to that in a bit, um, that, that comment that you made. Uh... So, vague as its description is, Brandon, it somehow gets muddier, right? Uh, usually, there's an inciting point where lake monsters come into vogue, right? Yeah. Like, typically, there's like there's like a story that you can be like, all right, this is pretty much the origin point of this lake monster. The one where it all like, popped off. This is where, like, shit, shit got, like, got serious or whatever. Yeah. Um, I don't see a very clear inflection point in the Ogopogo story, right? Um, I think some of this might actually be because there is some indigenous lore around Nahotic that helps blend and blur the lines, right? Um, even though I don't believe that the the entity of Nahotic is like actually that like aesthetically related to Ogopogo personally. Um but because of that, it makes it easier for people to like blend how along how far back stories go. Um, which I think is like in contrast to the Loch Ness Monster, which doesn't have that benefit. Right? Yeah. Um, and also because, like, we're, we we believe stories that are told about indigenous people way more than we believe stories that are told about white people. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Like, like when I say that, I mean fabrications, right? Um, we don't... We're just like, yeah, I don't know, probably when it comes to indigenous stories because they have it because they have verbal storytelling traditions as opposed to uh to like basically racism yeah um that's that's all there is to it uh so based on my reading of this existing war people believe that there was a snake like monster in lake okanaga and they saw it intermittently through the 19th century during the time that they first colonized the area um the monster was assigned the moniker of the Silex Nahotic, uh, despite the original le of legend having no real physical description of the creature beyond the tail. Um, notably, you know, in the hands of white people, it manifests as a zoological entity, where Nahotic was a mythological one. Um, so Ogopogo is literally the literal interpretation of a physical creature, right? Yeah. Um, we do, however, Brandon, have the supposed origin point for the Ogopogo name. Okay. Oh boy, it's a thing. So uh, the name is said to have been coined by Ronald Kenvin of the Vancouver Daily Province in 1926 uh -huh. when the Ogopogo Funny Foxtrot was played in Vernon, British Columbia. Now, Brandon, just just click on that link. It's a public domain, so it's on Wikipedia as an OG file. Oh, cool. Um, and you're gonna want to skip ahead to the point where the words, this lyrics start. So let me, let me. I didn't note when it started. Oh God, it's loud. Yeah. <laughs> it's loud and it's bad quality. Yeah, I mean, about, fair. About 30 seconds. About 30 seconds. 30 seconds? All right, let's go. Yeah. Oh, I'm already <clears throat> like 25 seconds in. Let's okay. see. 
It's like old Mickey Mouse music. Well, yeah. Oh, good. Just, just keep listening. Don't worry. Yeah. I'm so happy this isn't music anymore. <laughs> yeah, me too. So that's that's um that's... <laughs> so I don't know if you're gonna include that in the in the episode or not, but um it's it's something to listen to. It's it's definitely jaunty. a thing. <laughs> um I took a So note. the lyrics of the song The lyrics of the song are extremely questionable, Brandon. Um I don't know if you understood any of them. Uh, but it begins with what it sounds what sounds like a racist caricature of a person from su- Southern Asia. So I uh, looked that up as that was playing because I was like, "Yeah, that's a thing." So that's the Persian word for India. But I don't know that the guy writing that knows that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. So, uh, but but that's that's not even the like that's not even the most racist like thing in it, right? Yeah. Uh, one fine day in Hindustan. This is this is a direct quote from the from the lyrics. I met with a funny little man with googly eyes and a lantern jaw and lantern jaws, a new silk hat and some old plus fours. What's a so plus old plus four? fours? Those are like um, explorer pants. So it kind of sounds like he's describing like a kind of stereotypical like short Southern Asian person oh, to me. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Like wearing like because because the problem is when he asks him uh, what he's hunting, he quotes the response as like this weird pitchy voice. Yeah, to say, I'm looking for the ogopogo, the funny little ogopogo. His mother was a polywog. His father was a whale. I'm going to pull put a little bit of salt on his tail. So this is like like at this point, I'm just kind of like, oh, this dude's like doing a caricature, right? Because yeah. like. I, I don't know the the fact the fact that they say that like they're in Hindustan right and then they it's 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 questionable very it's much questionable. so right what year did this um, come out nineteen twenty six it's bad let's just let's just go by the year it's bad he, it was for it bad actually he did it came bad. out in nineteen twenty four even the, worse the the song was written yeah <laughs> um uh this subject this passage that I the last passage that I read the like thing that the dude says he's doing. Uh, mm-hmm. Subject to the iteration of the song, um, with the cited one of the cited iterations that I found uh, saying that Ogopogo's mother was an earwig. Um, huh. I used to have the biggest so, fear of earwigs. Yeah, me too. It was it's a completely irrational fear too. It was that like that it, that used to be a problem. Like I was. <laughs> you, there's a lot of stuff that like when you're a kid you think is a bigger deal than it actually is, and then like you get to become an adult and you're like. Ah uh, fuck! I hear water dripping, yeah. and that's the real fear. Yeah, there's, I, to this day, have not ran into quicksand. Do you know how much of a problem I thought that was going to be for me growing up? <laughs> I think I've actually encountered quicksand, <laughs> but like it was not that deep. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like that's kind of the thing. It's usually not that deep. Like. The secret to quicksand is just stand. Yeah. And don't, like, panic. Don't flail in a manner that it will just suck you. Pretend you're in, like, a fluid that has, that's, like, mostly suspended particles. And behave that way. Because that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, Imagine you're pre- drowning in pudding. <laughs> don't do the oh, thing I that would it. make you go deeper into pudding. But I want to eat the pudding. If it's butterscotch, I'd fuck that right up. Can I eat? Can I eat my way out of it? Oh fuck! I want. I want to eat my way out of a banana pudding. <laughs> like the kind that you get at buffets, right? That has like slices of banana in it. Yeah. Give me that. <laughs> um. But Brandon. Yeah. It gets worse. <laughs> So the provenance of the song, uh, speculated by uh, Frank Buckland, you know our our friend from earlier, who yeah. is probably a racist. He's definitely a racist. Uh huh. Um, because whatever. Uh, it's said to be related to the Boer War. 
Uh Uh, Specifically, and this is a quote from his article slash story that he told his family for their entertainment, a Zulu chieftain named Ogopogue who came to Johannesburg to discuss the war situation with British officers. So, Brandon, in in the best case, this song is mocking Southern Asians with a shitty accent and lyrics. Yeah. In the worst, it's actively mocking a black man who is in the midst of, like, one of the bloodiest wars in history. Yeah. It's very bad. It's very not good. (laughs) Yeah. Very much so. But what it does mean... What it does mean is Ogopogo is so fucking firmly rooted in colonization. Yeah. Like, yeah. So um, in terms of 20th century sightings, uh, it is notable that we verifiably have uh, articles that point to Ogopogo existing as a concept mm-hmm. before Nessie came into existence in 1933. Oh, so okay. we have actual, like, we have newspaper articles that legitimately say, Ogopogo with this, but you know, like all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're not even close to the end either. This is, there's so much more. Is this so uh, like getting a lot of bang for your buck on this bad boy? Yeah, yeah. I I gotta stop doing this. I started this episode, but when I started writing this episode, I'm like, all right, this is gonna be a short one. This is only, take, <laughs> this is only gonna take an hour. And then I wrote for three days. <laughs> Um, so chronologically, the next sighting that I can find about the creature occurs at some point in 1926 at Okanagan Mission Beach. Supposedly, 30 cars also saw Ogopogo at this time. However, there's no primary sources that I can find on the internet uh, that indicate that this happened. Uh, Just people mentioning the story because, you know, that's the way things go. Um, the sighting does align with the origin of the Ogopogo name, though. So... It's possible that either this sighted this sighting like fueled the dude like coming up with a name, yeah, or the name of the monster fueled the sighting. I'm not sure, uh, because I don't I don't know when I don't know when the actual sighting occurred. So like until I know that, I can't tell you more than that. Like in terms of detail, yeah. Um, I did, however, find two articles about the Ogopogo status as a living creature. Uh, the first from 1930 insists that the beast was still alive, and this is this is the the article. Ogopogo still lives, Hamilton, Ontario. Prompt action by Vernon, British Columbia, in broadcasting uh, denials that Ogopogo had died a violent death met with rewarded re- met with reward recently when the Union of Canadian Municipalities voted to meet next year at the Sea Serpent City, Vernon. Delegates promised a sighting of Ogopogo, and the vote was unanimous. <laughs> so it's talking about, like, a vote to have, like, a meeting in the city of Vernon. Yeah. And that they'd see Ogopogo, right? Yeah. Yeah. Weird. So there's another one uh, from 1931, a year later, that insists Ogopogo has died. Oh, good. Because no one's seen him in two years. Uh, the Ogopogo that had brought worldwide pr- publicity to the Okanagan Valley fruitlands in the province of British Columbia is dead. No one actually saw him die, but the mysterious <laughs> dweller of Lake Okanaga has not been seen for two years. Inquiries from all lakeside towns confirm that the belief that he has passed away from old age or other natural causes. It is hoped that his carcass will be washed up from the deeps so that it may be placed in a national museum. It is said to have the head of a sheep in a 50-foot body of a sea serpent. His name has been used for years with great profit as trademark for the principal fruit products of the interior of the product, Providence. So, um, we know for a fact then that, that like, Ogopogo as a concept predates 1931 then, because yeah. it, it's been used for years, it's used on apple containers, things along those lines. So we do know, we do know that there's, there's like a historical provenance for this predating Nessie, but I'd say Ogopogo in no way ever reach the same level of like notoriety as Nessie. Um, no. Because I feel like I feel like if I talk to someone about Ogopogo, like who doesn't know anything about cryptids, they don't know what Ogopogo is. They know what Nessie is. They don't know what Ogopogo is. You know what I just thought was um all these lake monsters, that if they were real at some point, shouldn't we have had a, like a globster? Like a lake globster? Something. Something like that. At least something. Yeah. Yeah. If I had a lot of money and access to SeaWorld, 
I would, I'd probably steal like a whale corpse and make a globster for a lake. Just to fuck with people. <clears throat> oh God! Like that would that that would blow some people's mind. Like a glob, like a lake globster. That would that, oh, would that would that would ruin people's day. Yeah, that would ruin people's lives. Yeah, people would become dedicated to like hunting down <laughs> yeah. something that never existed. Yeah. Jesus Christ! How villainous, Brandon. God. Uh, all right, all right. We need people to up their subscriptions. I need to buy a whale. <laughs> <laughs> we need to buy a dead whale. Yeah. <laughs> let me set let me set a uh, an objective on the a uh, goal <laughs> on the on the Patreon. What do you think that's going to set us back? Like a million? 2 uh, million? I don't know. See, there's also transport. I mean, Well, the the thing is, the thing is we also need to be discreet. How much does a whale cost? Um Mink whales are thirteen thousand uh, dollars. Much larger fin whales are eighty-five thousand dollars. So, let's shoot for. Um, let's do. Probably like we're gonna probably to need at least five. Uh, I mean, well, the problem is we want to make it sure it's subtle. So, um, so if we're dealing with eighty-five for a larger one. Probably we probably actually want to go with the minx whale because it's it'd probably be more of a it, we want to go with the smaller one because it's probably a better sell. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so we're dealing with sixteen. Uh, we have to pay the hush money, obviously, right? Because we got to get this thing from the coast yeah. to some interior lake. We need non-disclosures. So that's probably for sure. It's probably going to cost. That's well, we also have to keep a lawyer on retainer, so that's mm-hmm. probably going to cost us, you know, like hundred thousand easily, right? Um. The the cover up is more expensive than the whale, obviously. Yeah. Right? Uh, then then you know renting the flatbed truck depends on how heavy the whale is. Mm, let's say about three thousand dollars, right? Got to drive out under cover of night, drop the thing in. Uh, so uh, just to give us a little wheel room, let's say uh two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, we'll do. Yeah, that sounds. We'll we'll run with that. Because then we have then we have extra bribery money if we need it. Um. God. If I'm on a list, they're gonna have fun with this fucking Google search. <laughs> I I had I have how much does a whale cost, and then flatbed rentals near me. <laughs> <laughs> Take that CIA. <laughs> Technically, the CIA can't can't observe uh American residents because that's illegal. They, have, they don't have to with fucking your metadata and yeah I know uh, <laughs> it's it's yeah it's all sucks. It all sucks. people think they're individuals the thing is you're not and there's enough people <laughs> close enough to you that you can make a lot of very accurate assumptions based off yes. a very large data set of not a lot of information <laughs> yes it's <laughs> horrifying um so the next major sighting of the Ogopogo that I could find occurred in 1947 when a collection of boaters saw Ogopogo at the same time. Uh, the following is a quote from a witness, Mr. Cray, as pulled from the sightings page of OgopogoQuest.com. Once again, can't find a primary source. Uh, it had a long, sinuous body, 30 feet in length, consisting of about five undulations, apparently separated from each other by about a two-foot space in which part of the undulations would have been underwater. There appeared to be a forked tail, of which only one half came up above the water. From time to time, the whole thing submerged and came up again. This is, like, such a weird way to describe this if you had seen something. Yeah. But, whatever. Um, so, in terms of, like, the types of stories that we see, they almost exclusively follow this pattern. Right? Yeah. So, I am not going to be reading every single one of these stories. There's a fuck ton of them. But most of them are, I saw, like, humps in the water in, yeah. like, a week. That's the story. Um, there's also, so, I, there's, I don't, I could be wrong. I don't know that there's a serpent with a forked tail. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's not impossible. It, it's just gotta be, a, like, I mean, there's snakes with two heads, so. Yeah, uh, well, I, I mean, like, outside of, like anomalous physical features that weren't present on like most of the species you know i i don't i'm not confident enough about my knowledge of of uh of snakes to say one way or the other on that you know i've i've built you know i have a uh my, my career is a foundation of bullshit so i'll go out on the line and say there are no snakes with forked tails 
<laughs> All right. Well, if if somebody knows of a snake with forked tails, uh, post that. To I'll Brandon bet John's space. career on it. <laughs> Please don't. Please don't. That's that's. I've had to write so much. <laughs> Please don't. I'm so close. <laughs> I'm so close. <laughs> um, so the first photo of Ogopogo is said to have been taken by Eric Parmenter in 1964. Uh, I can't find any good context for the photo, and I'm not even sure if the photo that I have is in fact the photo um, that people are saying it is. Yeah. Uh, that being said, I assume this is the photo in, pre- is the photo in question, and regardless, it's underwhelming, right? Yeah, it's... Uh, so, Brandon, just describe <clears throat> that to me. It's a lake. There's, it's a picture of a lake. I wouldn't say that's a picture of a thing in a lake. It's just water. It, it looks like a sandbar, almost. Yeah, like, there's not... It could be a there's, sandbar. There's nothing... It could be a lot... There's nothing... There's not enough, there's not a lot of information in this photograph. There's there's nothing, like, interesting to look at in this photograph. A picture is worth ripples. a thousand words, and 950 of those words are just space bar. Like, it, it, it's, there's not a lot going on here. So, like, when you compare this to the Nessie Surgeon photo, it's really not a surprise that Ogopogo didn't get catapulted in the zeitgeist, right? Yeah. Because... Because the Nessie Surgeon photo, like, predates this by, like, I want to say, like, 30 years or something that like that. That uncropped photo was a very good get, by the way, when you did that episode. I had never seen that before. No? Like, I, I've full seen it photo. A, a few times. That, that's, that, once you see the uncropped photo, it's like, oh, this is bullshit. Yeah, that's, it's, it's. it's there's a reason it's, why you only see the cropped photo. <laughs> yes, because the uncropped one is dumb as shit. Yeah. Um so the next photo that I found is similarly uninspiring, uh being taken in 1976 by Ed Fletcher. Once again, zero context for the photograph. Um likely because uh the composition's shitty and vague. Yeah, this best. is somehow worse than the other. I I I mean you can see black marks, but like it it's useless. It's useless. There's, you don't know how big those are. You don't know how far out those are. Fully blown out. So it's like a fully white background. I mean, the only reason I know I'm looking at things in a lake is because I've been told I'm looking at things in a lake. If I saw this pretty much without the context of everything else around it, it, it could be a wave. It could it could be anything. It's just some black dots in the middle of a white background. Yep. Yep. Um, I also want to point out both of these photos. I had to like kind of dig to find. I had to do like multiple go- like searches to find it. Yeah, um, that checks out. So <laughs> it's getting harder and harder to find photos of stuff for some reason. Yeah, so um, when it comes to film, like videos, uh, there are a few of Ogopogo, supposedly. Um, The first one um, is uh, taken by Art Folden in August of 1968. Uh, Folden had been driving down Highway 97 with his family when he spotted something in the water. He pulled over and recorded the sighting with an 8mm movie camera. Um, Of what appears to be something of great length moving at great speed, I guess... Uh, personally, I can't see anything in the film. So, Brandon, did you did you open up the full and film to, yeah. to like a, a Facebook page? I'm watching it now. There's, it's you, you can't you can't assume speed from the video, and it because it doesn't necessarily look like it's moving. I mean, it doesn't like it's no, it's it's moving, but I couldn't you you don't get a good enough sense of scale or speed from the video itself. There's a thing in water, and the thing is moving. It could be a snake. Yeah. It could just be a snake. Um, yeah, I, I it's position like, relative to like the sh- the 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 shrubbery that you can actually see changes slightly. So it, it it's a thing; it moves whether it's under its own propulsion or just a current. You know, you can't really I, tell. I honestly can't tell. Like, like it, there is a black thing in the water, but that's it. That's all you know. That's all you see. Yeah, there's nothing else. It doesn't even look like it's doing any kind of undulation motion. It just looks like it's moving. Yeah. So like. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there's like a white cap that I can see there. I, I, I don't fucking know. Um, Folden estimated the object was some 300 yards offshore. 
Accounting for this, it was calculated that the very uh, large object was moving at incredible speed, and that's the only thing I've ever seen. I've never seen anyone say how long it was or how fast it was moving, but whatever. <sighs> uh, Joe Nickel and Radford would later attempt to recreate the footage in 2005. In their testing, they found that the object would have had to been far closer to the shore than originally assumed, meaning it was sm- smaller and slower than originally uh, uh, guessed. That makes sense. Yeah. I buy it. Yeah. Just from like, because that's, yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of the core problem with like sightings of things in the sky too, right? Because like yeah, it, distance to the object is everything. And if you get the distance wrong, like. that, Yeah, it, it's it's trick and that, you know, that you're missing yeah. the, the big variable. The other issue with things <laughs> in water and things in the sky is you lack frequently the context of things around it, right? Because That you know the size of. That you know the size of or that you know relative position of. Like, yeah. You can't, like, if there was just a ball in the sky and you, like, there was, you didn't see any trees or clouds or it, like, you have absolutely no way of knowing distance or speed or direction or anything. You, well, that's because we weren't adapted. Our, our adaptations for how our like vision system works aren't for that. That's like not like everything's. To, you have to compare. You just compare things to each other. That's all. You, and yes. without the ability to to make a comparison in a vacuum, it yeah, it's useless. Yeah. Um. It's so, not a good data set. Get me good data. <laughs> so there. There was a film between this film and the Damara footage that I'm going to talk about next okay. called the F- Thal film. I literally couldn't find it, the Thal film. So, like, I don't know. It's it's very much, like, discredited and discounted. Yeah. Um, so I didn't bother looking any harder. Um, the Devar- Damara footage is typically, ci- all, like, very frequently cited as, like, some key evidence of Ogopogo. Uh, the film itself consists of three segments filmed in 1992. Uh, the first is... In the first, multiple wakes can be seen traveling across the water. Uh, when vi- viewed as a still frame, these wakes appear to be one consistent entity. However, uh, in motion, they appear to be moving perpendicular to the ex- direction that you'd expect them to. What do you see? I'm what watching, you, wh- wh- I'm how, watching the you? video, and if this was a real creature, someone would have just hit it with a jet ski. Oh, 100%. <laughs> yeah, they hit it with a boat. Yeah. If it was a real thing, they hit it with a boat, right? Yeah. Um, if it's anything, it looks like there's multiple creatures moving in the water near each other, right? Um, but yeah, no, they definitely, they definitely slam into that. I was not expecting to, to see a guy on a jet ski. Not a jet water ski. It's a boat pulling a guy on water skis. Yeah, um, and he like falls directly in the middle of it. Yeah, so like if it was a serpent, this guy would have done get edited. What I my guess is is they're out there on a water ski and you know how the boat and then there's a wake and then that happens my guess is he just did a pass with the water ski and you're looking at the wake from the boat and he circles back around and he tries to run over his own wake because he can get a make a cool jump because that's a thing people do you, you make that's... a turn and then you try to go through your own wake you're looking at the, the jet ski wake I, I honestly i honestly think that this might be like like just otters too or like fish. Don't hit a fish with a boat. That's a dick move. It is a dick move, but like it, it could be that too. It's it's there's no way that this is a sea monster. At, no. Right? At best a guy tried to do a jump off the wake from his boat, and at worst a guy tried to hit a fish with his boat. Pretty much. <laughs> um The segments followed by two other segments that show an object breaching the water at a distance from the person filming. Uh, but the quality of the footage is so terrible that I literally it could literally be anything, right? Um, it's it's very unconvincing footage, albeit very funny footage. Um, because the the water skier definitely eats shit, and yeah. like as we know, that's fucking hilarious. Always. Um, so in terms of what Ogopogo actually is, Brandon, mm-hmm. uh, I didn't mention all the sightings, right? Uh, because. They're so fucking numerous and so fucking samey. It's 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 the curse of the what lake monster, right? Yeah. Um we we've done this we've done the lake monster song and dance a number of times and every time we do the lake monster song and dance it's the same shit, right? Yeah. Every time somebody sees a lake monster, it's just like I saw something in the water. 
cool. What was it? I don't know. Might be a monster, right? Yeah. Um, that that's pretty much it. So whatever. It's it has numerous sightings in the 20th century, and there are still sightings into the 21st. Um, it was so it's such a popular creature that at one point there was a million dollar reward for its capture in the 80s. Um, that was of course instituted by the Regents Tourism Association. Because oh, of course. course, that makes sense. Um. For some, the Okanagan Valley. Uh, for some in the Okanagan Valley, Ogopogo has become a cherished icon, the su- subject of art installations, TV shirts, and massive tourism draw. Ogopogo, or Agi, as it has been affectionately called by some, has become big business in the region. Right? Yeah. It is. It is like very much a part of it. Like, <laughs> I also have a little thing here. It also has a Yu-Gi-Oh card. I see Danger, that. Ogopogo. There's actually Brandon. I yep. found this out. There's a whole bunch of Yu-Gi-Oh cards that are danger followed by the name of a cryptid. So like oh, danger, cool. Bigfoot and stuff like that. Um, they're weird cards. There's a danger Mothman. I don't know. Whatever. I don't play Yu-Gi-Oh anymore. Um, but Brandon, the question remains, what is Ogopogo? Conspicuously, Western stories, the creature mellowed out from the its transition during a transition from Nahotic to Ogopogo, right? Yeah. So that's that's worth noting um what settlers called the water demon at one point is now a beloved character uh which bastardizes you know the sacred element of silex culture yeah um but like i also want to really really highlight this because when it's when it's when it's the indigenous people's story it's violent when it's the white people's story it's not violent there's you, yeah. you don't have to there's not a bunch of dots to connect it's literally a straight line in this one yeah um so on the kind of plus side uh <laughs> the town of vernon did give up its copyright to okopogo recently to the okanagan nation okay Na- nation's alliance yeah uh the authorities of the city indicated that they had never used it. Had, they had never used it for commercial purposes, except for the fact that they literally used it for commercial purposes. Yeah, except for that whole um, part. Just, just if you just scroll, if they just scrolled up a little bit, they could see us. Uh, talking of it. about talking about the you know million dollar tourism board thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that's a thing. Um, like I said, I personally question that. There's a fuck ton of Ogopogo merch, um, and I should also say this action. Resolves fucking nothing. It's literally yeah. the city doing the bare minimum. Yeah. Um. So, return to what Ogopogo is. Uh, it's no longer a meta- metaphysical creature, right? It's a flesh and blood creature, um, but it has no real analog in the fossil record, right? No. It's clearly not a plesiosaur. It's not a metas- mesosaur. Uh, and to my knowledge, the a sea serpent like creature of Ogopogo's size is non-existent. Uh, that being said, of course, young earth creationists have appropriated for their purposes. Oh, good. I'm um, comparing it to, to Cartabasaurus, which is a thing that we're going to cover in the future. Cause I think you already have a copy about it. I do. Um, <laughs> so some people, some people consider like, think that Ogopogo is Cartabasaurus that like got landlocked or something, but yeah. whatever. I mean, that's that's like so deep into your layers of delusion at that point that it's like, what the fuck are you doing? Um, so the popular solution, though, Brandon, for most water dwelling creatures that we have, uh-huh. you know, the surgeon doesn't actually apply in this case. Oh, good. They're not endemic to the lake. Like there's actually an, a, a standing like reward for anyone who finds a sturgeon in the lake. That's funny. Yeah. Um, but I am going to say that I think Joe Nickel, once again, has the best hypothesis. Otters. Yep. Uh, not all sightings are otters. Some could be rocks, logs, other detritus, you know. Uh, is it, is it flotsam when it's in the water, right? There's flotsam and jetsam. Flotsam. Yeah. I think flotsam's in the water and jetsam's on the shore. I could be wrong. Um, it's the same thing. It's just where it is. Uh, so otters, however, do account for a decent number of the general descriptions of Ogopogo, right? Yeah. They swim through the water and on undulating patterns are endemic to the region. When viewed from afar, their fur is dark, smooth, and shiny. Moreover, they sw- 
if they swim in a line, it's possible for them to resemble the kind of wakes that are images that are attributed to Ogopogo. Otters are also fast little fuckers. I don't know if you've ever seen an otter swim. So fast. But they fucking cruise. Um, and, uh, like, their their cruising speed is six miles per hour. They can go way fucking faster than that. Yeah. If they need to. Um, so, I don't question the sincerity of witnesses. Uh but rather that we're bad at identifying stuff in the water. Um, and there's like a little picture of what the what an Ogopogo uh, otter would look they're like. They're adorable. Oh, also, they're flotsam a- is just shit that's floating in the water, but not on purpose. Yeah. Jetsam is stuff you throw overboard on purpose. Oh, oh, because jettison. Yeah. Got it. Got it. It's basically the same thing, though. Yeah, it's basically like, is it floating because you After- were sinking and you were throwing it off to try to not sink? Or is it floating because you done sunk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it, it really at the end of the day it's whether or not you've lost co- like lost sight of the thing because yeah. it could be jetsam and then the second you lose sight of it and you see it again now it's flotsam yeah um but uh I, to close this episode out brandon i do want to tell one more story that i found sure. from the okanagan historical society to highlight how bad we are at identifying things in water um and it's called An Ogopogo Tale by Alice Fraser. Okay. Fraser. Whatever. Phrasing. Um, his story about Ogopogo goes back a long way to the 1930s. When I was growing up in Kelowna, I, and it was told to the group of us that we're down at the aquatic stadium. So this dude's told this story when he's at the aquatic stadium in 1930s Kelowna. Right? Yeah. Um, this, is, this is like a secondhand account that was told to Alice. You know, a whole thing like that. Uh, the two lifeguards during that season were Don Poole and Roy Longley. This is their story. Bum, bum. <laughs> <laughs> um, these two fellows were lifeguards during swimming hours, and the rest of the time they were maintenance men, first aiders, and all around do anything that needed to get done, need doing handy men. That's a, that's a single sentence. By the, that's a single word, by the oh, way, with hyphens. Um, they slept in a couple of rooms under the grandstand and so acted as caretakers and also provided a type of se- security. I'm like, they're like half, they're like almost living in a van down by the river at this point. Yeah. Um, There's a lot of one like evening, crushed PBR cans float laying around them. If this were the 60s. Did PBR exist in the, in the 30s? When did PBR, oh, let's just see, when did PBR? Uh, Peps Blue Ribbon, 1844. Okay, yeah, might have been PBR cans. Yeah. There's a chance. There's a solid chance yep. of just there being PBR chance. Um, so one evening before retiring for the night, Don said that he was looking out the window of his room, which faced south, admiring the view of the moonlight sparkling in the water. When he thought he saw something strange in the water, the object seemed to be moving very slowly offshore, and he thought coming north towards the aquatic. Then he saw two fairly large lumps, and a short while later, just one hump. No splashing or noise like a slimmer swimmer might make, just silence. So it wasn't a motorboat or someone rowing a boat as no oars were visible. It must be Ogopogo. What else? Off to Roy's room he went, and back they came into view of this thing. It was still there in the water, closer now, again, two humps in view. There was nothing else I could else to do but get in their canoe and get closer uh, if they could. Silently, they paddled around the point uh, and on towards the black object. Once or twice, they thought the thing was headed towards them, and they hastily back paddled. But nothing happened. Eventually, they got up the nerve to paddle behind the thing, and one of them hit it with a paddle. Whap! <laughs> a soggy thud, and the canoe was quickly paddled in reverse again. Then, as nothing attacked them, the canoeist got up nerve and approached and touched the object, discovering it was two overturned baskets oh, God. attached together <laughs> by a bamboo stick, which was underwater. And this is this is exactly what this story says. I find it knowing what I know about British Columbia, I get like instantly anxious about what what they're about to say. <clears throat> yeah. Um these baskets were used for many years by the Chinese vegetable men to carry produce <laughs> around to sell <laughs> my body's sell made of carrots. <laughs> Pretty much. I, I'm an incredible pain. No, they actually have a very large um which which they area do. of Canada is this? This is British Columbia and the reason they have yeah. a large population is because of uh using chinese laborers and abusing them yeah you know canada (laughs) it's great if you're white 
Canada. <laughs> um, Don and Roy figure out that the set of baskets had broken loose from its home in Mill Creek, where the where the Chinese kept them. <laughs> And and you know so the thing about the the reason like I'm I'm like leery of this is you know that the way that they said it wasn't just like like you know they did they didn't just say it like oh those people over there they said it like there was an intonation yeah they they put a little with. stank on the word and not in a yeah, good way this this was not this was not just like a casual mention this was this was deliberate um and they said like it a little bit slower than the rest of the words. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Um, so it flowed down the creek and into the lake when a gentle breeze or current had made it drift north. Both men were so embarrassed at being afraid of two vegetable baskets, they decided not to tell anyone of the other adventure for some time. Eventually, they told the, they told the story on themselves as it was such a good tale. Imagine being afraid of a couple baskets, said one of them, and they thought they saw an eye a couple times, probably a hole in one of the baskets in the moonlight shining through. <laughs> And uh, that's that's the most in-depth story about the Ogopogo that I could find. So um, I guess that means Ogopogo is just a bunch of baskets. Ogopogo's baskets solved. Yeah. Mystery solved. I think we can close we can close out Ogopogo pretty thoroughly now. Um, <laughs> fucking Ogopogo. Oh, there's a, I like that story at the end. The story was good. I I like that's. The reason I I, I, I say that toward the end because like I was like, ah we don't have any like good like long stories about like a good account because like most yeah. of them are just like, I saw this thing. Like usually usually you have at least one good story that's like a little bit elaborate. Yeah. But like there's not many elaborate stories for Ogopogo, but I think that's an artifact of it being a lake monster. Yeah. Lake monsters are hard, because lake monsters are always like they're always like, I saw something in the wake. Describes a sturgeon. I saw something in the wake. Describes a log. Yeah. It couldn't have been a log, except it totally could have been a log, because you're saying that it couldn't have been a log. <laughs> um, anywho, that's all I got for this week's episode. Um, if you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to check us out uh, on our things. We have our website, cryptopediacast.com, which if you're listening to this podcast, it's basically not useful unless you want links to all of our various places. Um, but if you want to go to our various places, go cryptopediacast.com. We got your links. Yeah, it, uh, it's got the links. Um, Instagram is at cryptopediacast. Twitter is at cryptopediacast. Our email is cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast.com. We have a Patreon, as we mentioned in the episode. Help us buy that dead whale carcass that we can travel across straight lines into a, a lake. We need that dead whale money. We need that dead whale money. We need it. We're going to put it in Lake Champlain. Let's do Lake Champlain. Oh, yeah, it'll be a champ. We'll make yeah, a champ well, that, well, that Then we can also like reduce our costs because we can pretty much get there from Massachusetts. I mean, right? we could do so, a Kipsy a Kipsy we carcass. We could do Kipsy, but but then That's we're gonna have to be prevalent we, though. We need to pick one of the more be, prevalent ones. Let's let's do one let's do one where we're like not crossing it. Let's minimize the number of state lines we cross. Gotcha. Just just to keep the FBI out of it. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> so uh and we have a, a jackalope level supporter uh thing that you get access to the episode copies and a few other things when we ever make audio content anymore when we have in our, our ample amounts of free time what with Brandon having a child and me having a PhD that I'm working on she can walk now she likes to try to grab things off tables that's where my time's going keeping her from grabbing things off tables that sounds like a whole time she's so strong too she can lift like a Yankee candle she'll just grab those are heavy by the way like it's a jar full of oh, no, I know I know she got that baby strength she'll take it and, and start running somewhere with it and it's like hey this is my candle Don't now. Don't do this. Like, this is my candle. Yeah. She's 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 getting the she's getting the candle gene early. Yeah, we, I'm a candle. Usually I like it takes usually it takes longer for for someone to get into candles, but she's already in it. Yeah, she's in she's it. She's in deep. She's ho she's hoarding candles. <laughs> she's in it. Uh so if you're a jackalope, you get uh you know the episode of copies like John said. Uh you get your own special Discord channel and you get thanked on episodes. So here's the people that are helping John and I buy that fat whale carcass. Clay Sinclair, yes. Marty Von Party, 
Bird Schneider, Lenwood Sharp, Matthew Smith, Bushcraft Kelso, and Will Smith. And I did I save it? I, I I had an idea for for another like audio thing to do, like a bonus audio. I have to see if I saved it though. Well, you had all those Lovers Lane. Was it Lovers Lane or Last La- Last uh, of Vicious Lore? I had Lascivious Lore. I had Lascivious Lore. Well, the Lascivious Lore is like really short episodes. Then I had yeah. Lovers. I had a relationship one. Uh, there's you I had a, a few of them. Uh, oh, they all start with L's. Yeah, that was the joke. It wasn't even on purpose. It was just something you pointed out that I was doing. <laughs> Wait, really? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't on purpose. I didn't even notice it until you pointed it out. (laughs) Um, We also have a Facebook group that I don't post anything to. Um, Somebody actually recently applied and I let them in, but there's not really much there. The Discord's really where it's at. Discord's popping. Um, If you you enjoy the podcast, be sure to rate, review, subscribe. Our Spotify number, our Spotify rating has gone down a little bit. Um, I think it, I think it might've been the person who got mad at us. Uh, that I didn't make any. It's always I limited my. It's always sunny references. <laughs> um, if you have any monster requests or stories, be sure to send them in. I, I am as we've mentioned multiple times in this podcast. You know that you know that scene from Wallace and Gromit where uh, Gromit's the dog, right? Yes. Yeah, where the dog is like you know laying down tracks as the train's going. Yeah, that's me with episodes. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if, if you got anything, let me know. Give John suggestions. Give John suggestions through our Discord and, and do it through our special Jackalopes channel because then he thinks it'll be fun. Well, if you do it through the Jackalopes channel, uh, as long as it's not when to go, I'll pretty much do it. Anything, but yeah, give John suggestions, mostly non-Canada. Yeah, let's, I made the choice to do a Canada one this time. <laughs> I inflicted this upon myself. <laughs> so I'm allowed to inflict pain against myself when it comes to can- Canadian episodes. Um, Someone give John other a thing- list of young Earth creationist dinosaurs. Make him do a grab bag. So that's that's another thing. I could have gone down the young Earth creationist route on this, but it's like thankfully less emphasized in this story. Um but I have to be careful with how often I do those because they hurt my soul. They're not good for your blood pressure. We're at an age where that's the thing we have to monitor now. Yeah. <laughs> I hate being older. <laughs> Anywho. Brandon, why don't you give your like little pluggable thing? Yeah, you could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. It looks a lot like a food thing now because I... I it was a whole, I had a plan, and then I got lazy with it. So it looks like I'm a food brand. Anyway, my br- email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. My Twitter is at cryptobrandon and at Heinz Canada. Something I've been lazy with my Heinz account. I've got to pick that up again. Yeah. Well, you got to be careful. You got to keep the, you got to keep the, the you got to keep the fu- the fuzz off you. I got to keep the fuzz. No, I got the account unlocked. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. you got to keep the, the the Twitter fuzz off you. Yeah, because do. you don't want to you don't want to get it locked. They purged a lot of my bots. I will say that. I will say they purged my bots. God damn it! Uh, on Instagram, I'm at mute twenty fifty seven. My Twitter is at JF Dunham. My website is johndunhamgames.com, and my email is john at cryptopediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com. His email is tommikehill at gmail.com, and his webcomic is Super Salad, so I'll throw that out there. Super Salad, the Instagram thing. Oh, I didn't realize that was like a, a webcomic. I've seen bits of it. I just didn't realize he like had that as like a, a thing. Yeah, it's his own separate uh, thing. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool. I've seen a few. I've seen a few. They're pretty good. Um. So as always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird.
little man with googly eyes and lantern jaws and old silk hat and hairy paws. When I said to that sweet old chap, why do you carry that big steel trap, the butterfly net and rusty gum? He replied, it's my time, I'm looking for the old pro po po the funny little old pro po po His brother was a polywog, his father was a way like boy, to put little big boys on his tail. I want to find the old pro po po while he's playing on his old banjo. I just want to take him. 